Hey, thanks for watching this week's video. If you do enjoy, please leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications. There's literally nothing else that would help this channel grow than that. If you'd like to support me outside of that, head on over to my Patreon where you can support me for as little as $1 per month. If you'd like to pick yourself up a very finely made t-shirt or sticker, head on over to cnp-productions.com slash store and pick it up today. The shirts come in sizes from extra small to 2XL in black, navy, gray, and red. And the stickers come in three, four, and five and a half inch sizes. There are new designs released each week and the designs are always released three to four days in advance of the video, so make sure to check back regularly. Now, without further ado, let's learn about the terrifying true story of the man responsible for simultaneously destroying and creating families and his decade-long record. Along the Georgia-Tennessee border, there lies a town split in two. On one side, it's called McKaysville, Georgia. On the other, it's Copper Hill, Tennessee. Like most places in the South, these twins are a peaceful, idyllic slice of small town living in an otherwise hectic and ever-changing world. It's the kind of town, or towns, where people take the time to raise their whole hand when they wave instead of just one finger. With a combined total hovering around 1,500 residents, these towns are as small as they are quiet, and that's the way they all like it. On the opposite side of the Tennessee border, right up against Kentucky, there was a baby born in 1888 who would come to call that divided town home and turn it into a national sensation within a hundred years. Before long, this man would begin to make a name for himself, graduating from Tusculum College, Carson Newman College, and Emory University Medical School. This man, named Thomas J. Hicks, would go on to open a medical clinic in McKaysville in 1945. With the divided town being part of a larger mining region, there were always miners in need of medical treatment who would come to his clinic for cheap and sometimes free medical care. For 20 years, he was the premier medical expert in these towns and to most is still loved by those who knew him. However, this story is certainly not as cut and dry as the proponents may have you believe. After his graduation from Emory in 1917, he moved back to Tennessee and took up a job as a pharmacist while obtaining the funds necessary to open his own clinic. For many of these years, his biggest selling point was painkillers of all sorts. Understandable as this may be, given that he was in a mining region, it had been illegal to sell any opiates and cocaine since 1914 with the Harrison Act, one of the first moves of the temperance movement of the early 20th century. In fact, by 1918, the US was officially a, a dry nation, and in 1920, the Prohibition Act came into play and alcohol would join the fray. Given this, and the fact that the Hicks's most popular painkillers were all opiates in nature, he would be arrested after a attempting to sell painkillers to a veteran of the Great War who had gone to work with the FBI. After his conviction, he would be stripped of his medical license and sent to prison where he would spend the next few years. Now, while he served his sentence, he would study a lung disease that could potentially keep minors from living past 40 years old. After serving his time, he took up a job at a Tennessee copper company where he treated copper miners for this newly found lung disease. Now at the same time, given that he lived right on the Tennessee-Georgia border, he went to reacquire his medical license in Georgia around the same time. After reacquiring his license, he would begin prescribing an assortment of treatments for the miners he worked with at this copper company. Whether he was helping or not, it was later found out that he had ended up filing more claims and prescriptions than there were miners that ever worked at this company. Whether these claims were for other mining operations in the area or entirely falsified as a whole, we have no real idea, though I speculate the latter is more likely than the former. After making enough money, he would purchase a building in McKaysville and set up the Hicks Community Clinic.
Until 1973, with the landmark Supreme Court case in Roe v. Wade, abortion was a federally outlawed practice across the entirety of the United States. Now, while I'm not about to make qualitative judgments about the practice here, and though I have made my beliefs and positions known in the past, the practice was and is a largely dangerous procedure when done outside of a clinical environment. Knowing this, and not on particularly friendly terms with federal law at the time, Dr. Hicks would use the back rooms of his clinic as clean rooms to perform illegal abortions on women who came and requested the procedure. Now, he would also largely perform these abortions for free, and would fund his work through the main functions of the clinic itself. Many people paid highly for one of, if not the only, doctor in town to treat their ailments, and he would even make house calls if requested. He was a charismatic individual, and it came in handy more often than not. During this time, he was married to his wife, Chas Hicks, and they had three children, Thomas J. Hicks Jr., Walter Lynn Hicks, and Margaret Mary Hicks. From all accounts, he had a loving and stable family life, and through his clinic and the many properties in town that he came to own, he was able to provide a very comfortable lifestyle for them. His eldest son, Tommy, would join the U.S. Naval Reserves in 1941 and marry Sally Cobb Johnson in 1942. After the end of World War II, Tommy and his wife would try to begin their own family, but found that Sally was incapable of conception. Now, still wanting to start a family and being fresh out of the Naval Reserves, Tommy and Sally would move back to McKaysville and look into adoption. With Tommy becoming a dentist and working out of offices owned by his father, he would consistently ask Thomas about whether or not the women who came to him for assistance were willing to carry their children to term and give them up for adoption instead. With this new idea, Dr. Hicks would begin counseling his patients as to alternatives to abortion. Eventually, he would find success, and with the first baby delivered, he had asked Tommy and Sally if they wanted to adopt. In the end, Sally was the one to say no, as she wanted to look elsewhere for adoption. With this response, Dr. Hicks decided to contact a client couple he knew was looking to adopt and gave them the child instead. Soon, to match his ever-growing popularity in the towns and surrounding counties, Dr. Hicks had lines of people both looking to abort and others to adopt. In fact, there was one point where his clinic became so popular that the towns came together and built a runway for planes to take off from and land to as people across the country were becoming more and more familiar with this man and his practice. Soon, however, this took a much darker turn. By 1950, Dr. Hicks was providing a very steady stream of newborns for adoption, and his abortions seemed to be keeping up. But how in the world could this be? Well, it turns out that this entire time, many, if not all, of the women who came to Dr. Hicks with the intentions of bringing their children to term began giving birth prematurely. How is that possible? Statistically, that is almost entirely unlikely to happen. As it turns out, Dr. Hicks may have been inducing these women weeks and sometimes months before they were due. He did so to give them the impression that the women were having natural premature births and then would take the babies to the back room to be cleaned up where he would sell them to the next person in line for adoption. In fact, it became such a practice that he installed a drive-through window on the back of the building so the expecting adoptees could drive up, hand him an average of $1,000, and be handed a newborn baby with a birth certificate to be sent in the mail. In short, Dr. Hicks turned adoptions into a fast food industry by forcing the birth mothers to go into labor months before they were due, giving birth to four to eight week premature babies, turning around and handing them out the window like a commodity and then going back to the mothers and telling them that their children were stillborn or died due to premature complications, never to see these children again. This is one of the most abhorrent, atrocious, and evil acts I have ever had the displeasure of researching. Dr. Hicks drugged women to steal their babies and sell them for $100 per person. How in the world could he have kept this a secret? 
Well, it turns out he didn't entirely. It was widely known across the US for a time that he was selling newborns to willing couples, but the methods of how he acquired them were well enough hidden from the general population as a whole. In fact, most in town saw him as a hero. Dorothy Abernathy is a woman who grew up alongside Hicks's daughter Margaret and was a close friend of the Hicks family. If you ask her, she sees the practices he performed as a necessary business, yet still a sad one. She has remarked on several occasions that there were no better alternatives for safer abortions at the time. She believes that these women deserved to get the abortions that they so desired. Similarly, if these were people wanting to adopt children and he happened to be willing to sell them, why shouldn't they be allowed to have them? Ms. Abernathy has little to say on the subject of the forced deliveries. So, what happened to the children? Where are they now? And what do they know about where they come from? If you got a real mess and want to clean like the pros, then you've got to see this. Hi, Billy Mays here with Zorbies, the most absorbent material I've ever used. It has the strength and the muscle to pick up and hold over 20 ounces of liquid. Look at this. Zorbies attracts liquid like a magnet. It doesn't matter if it's coffee, soda, even red wine. Watch as its powerful vacuum action pulls and cleans the stain from out of the carpet just that quick. The secret's in the X27 fiber technology, making Zorbies over 27 times more absorbent than cotton. Forget towels that just grip, and unlike sponges that smell, Zorbies is odor free and leaves a path of clean. Now you can clean and dry and never leave anything behind. You'll be amazed at just how much they absorb. And they're machine washable. Dry your entire car, even your dog. Use any cleaner for streak-free windows. An average family uses up to two rolls of paper towels every week. That's cash in the trash. Save money and even help save the environment. You get two jumbo Zorbies plus three extra large, and as a special bonus, we'll also include our Micromen microfiber duster. Free. It's great for blinds, plants, glass, and more. And attracts dust like a magnet. And here's the best part. We'll send you a set of Zorbies free whenever you need them for life. Just pay shipping and processing. Order today. Stephen Dilbeck was born sometime around the year 1950. Never having met his birth parents, he was adopted soon after his birth. Growing up different from the rest of his siblings, he knew from a very young age that he was out of place somehow, but it wasn't until around 12 years old that he learned he was adopted. You see, he got into an argument with some of his family and remembers being told, you may be part of this family, but you aren't part of this family. He would go to his mother and try to understand where she told him that his birth mother had died in childbirth and so she adopted him. As he grew up, it became more and more apparent that he was not entirely welcome in his own home. His siblings treated him differently. His parents only took care of them as they needed to, not as they did the others, and his extended family barely spoke to him. One day, after continuously asking his mother what his birth mother's name was, she told him that rather than having died in childbirth, she sold him for a thousand dollars and wanted nothing to do with him. Since that day, for almost his entire life, he spent his days searching for answers to who his mother was, where he came from, and if he truly belonged anywhere. For most of his life, he's had no one and wanted nothing. He lived a lonely, dark existence, constantly searching for who he is and why he was given away. Did his mother really not love him? Did his father hate him? Did he truly not have anybody in this world? Diane Warner was born sometime around 1960. Never having known she was adopted until she was older, she grew up believing that her parents were her birth parents. It wasn't until one day when she found out after looking through old family records she was adopted and her parents weren't actually her parents. Since then, she's been looking for signs as to who and what her parents were. Did she have siblings? Did her parents just give her away? Was she better off for not knowing them? Today, she lives happily with her husband and five kids. 
two of whom were adopted. She's never stopped looking and has been doing so for more than 20 years. Whoever her parents were, wherever she was from, she doesn't hold it against them. She knows today that they couldn't have known what Dr. Hicks was doing with those babies and that they had been fed a lie. All she wishes for is the chance to reunite with someone, anyone in her biological family, to understand where she came from and who she is. Her adopted mother, Betty Johnson, has always loved Diane as her own. When Diane found out, she was there for her and was open and willing to discuss everything she had questions about. Betty and her husband were from Michigan. You see, her husband was unable to conceive, and the two had been attempting to do so for years to no avail. At the time, if you wanted to adopt a child in Michigan, you needed to own a house, have a certain level of income per year, and you were not allowed to have any fiscal debts. As you can imagine, this made the entire process far more difficult for most people. Now one day, she hears that Dr. Hicks is putting children up for adoption for $1,000 a piece, and the two get on a list to get one. They are called down, they pick Diane up, and they take her all the way back on that 24-hour trip home. Cindy Stapleton was born around 1961 and did not know her birth parents. While she knew she was adopted, she did not know about the Hicks Clinic until the late 90s and had searched for her birth mother ever since. Around 2014, she would finally find what she was looking for. Her mother, Lita, lived not too far away. You see, Lita gave birth to Cindy at 18 years old. She was involved with a man much older than her, and all of her co-workers called him Pickles. Now, Pickles was certainly not the best boyfriend to Lita. When the two found out that Lita was pregnant, Pickles wanted nothing to do with it, and after much deliberation, Lita decided to get an abortion. When she went to the Hicks Clinic, Dr. Hicks was able to persuade her not to abort, but rather give the baby up for adoption. She was told that Hicks's son, Tommy, was going to adopt, and that the baby would be in good hands. She was induced four weeks early, and Cindy was taken off and given to her adopted parents less than 24 hours later. Lita was told that rather than be adopted, her daughter had died due to premature heart complications. Afterwards, Hicks paid Lita $20 for the procedure, and she left, never thinking about it again. When the two reunited, there was tension in the room. Lita was reluctant to believe that Cindy was her daughter, believing her daughter had died all those years ago. When Cindy confirmed through DNA testing that she was really her daughter, Lita was stubborn in her disposition. When Cindy questioned her actions and behavior, she fought back, believing that she had done nothing wrong in the situation. Eventually, the two would stop talking sometime in late 2015, leaving a very bitter taste in Cindy's mouth. Melinda Stapleton, no relation, always knew that she was adopted. When she asked who her parents were and why, she was always told that her father was a very prominent man in the community. You see, she grew up believing that a scandalous affair must have happened and that the knowledge of her birth could have upended everything if it were to come out. She grew up in a loving family that supported her search for her birth parents, though they had absolutely no idea who was involved in the scenario. They wanted a child because they couldn't make one of their own, so they were willing to pay the thousand dollars to do so. All her life, she's known that something was taken from her. She may have had an entire family that she never got to meet and has always resented Dr. Hicks for that. John Stapleton, once again no relation to either, was born sometime around 1964, as far as he knows. He was one of two adopted children, though only he was from the Hicks Clinic. He always knew that he and his sister shared no relation to each other or to their parents, but it never really mattered to him. He grew up in a loving family that was always there to support each other. In 1984, he joined the military at 20 years old. He would go on to make military life his career for the next 20 years and would even participate in Operation Desert Storm. One day, his sister calls him up and tells him that she's found her birth parents, and after leaving the military, he would eventually decide to search himself. You see, he found out about the Hicks Clinic after hearing about it on TV, but wouldn't realize his own connection until years later. Since then, he's looked for any connection to his birth parents. 
Does he have siblings? Why was he given up? Did his mother even survive childbirth? Did his father even know that he was born? Jane Blasio was born sometime around 1965, as far as she knows. When she was six years old, she and her sister, who was 11 at the time, were playing in the backyard when they were called in to talk to their father. He sat them down at the kitchen, and he got his wife. We have something to tell you, and it may be hard for you to understand. You two were adopted. Do you know what that means? From that moment on, the idea of who her parents were was burned into her mind and would eventually consume her life. She would end up joining law enforcement and used her skills gathered there to discover the great and terrible story of her origins. She confronted her adopted father with the knowledge that she and her sister were sold illegally. You see, her father knew that what Hicks was doing was illegal, but her mother wanted a child so badly and didn't want to know anything about it, so her father was willing to do anything. She discovered that the falsified birth certificate placed her adopted adopted parents, Jim and Joan, illegally as her actual birth parents. So the system looked as if her parents, who couldn't conceive, had done so twice. During her teen years, she discovered that the Hicks Clinic led to a small town on the Georgia-Tennessee border. She made her first trip to McKaysville back in 1988, after her mother's death from a fight with cancer. During her quest for answers, she found that she was just one of over 200 children sold in the back alley of this now-abandoned clinic. In 1997, after gathering enough information and courage, she would tell the world, and would bring this to the attention of many of the others around her. Hicks could not have gotten away with all of this on his own, and he didn't. As it turns out, he had the legal assistance of not only the chief of police in McKaysville, but the town's mayor. They valued his work as a vital part of the community, and believed that whatever happened in the back rooms of his clinic was better left unseen and unknown to the public at large. Eventually, however, his actions would catch up with him. His clinic would be closed down sometime after 65, making Jane, her sister, and John Stapleton some of the last babies ever delivered by the clinic. What happened to the records? There has to be something connecting the Hicks babies to their parents, right? Well, there most likely was, and while there may still be somewhere, as far as we know, the records may have been destroyed. You see, Dr. Hicks had owned a mausoleum. However, strangely, neither himself, his wife, or any family members are buried inside. All of them are buried in the land around it. Back in the late 90s, when all this broke first, Jane had acquired a search warrant for the mausoleum, but nothing came of it. The mausoleum was designed as such. The front doors, which swing outward, open to a very narrow space with the four sealed crypts only one to two feet from the external doors themselves. Whoever has or had the key, it is now lost and the search warrant was posted on the inside of the main doors facing out of the glass inset to show people its usage. However, when the crypts on the inside of the mausoleum were opened in 2019, it was found that inside one of the previously sealed crypts was the warrant, folded up and mostly intact. For that to happen means that someone had not just the key to the mausoleum, but the individual crypts themselves. Whoever did take the warrant off the doors, opened the crypts, took whatever may or may not have been in there, and placed the warrant inside, folded and almost entirely undamaged. If there ever was any records, they're now lost and may never be found again. Today, after the events of the TLC three-part series that I highly recommend anyone here goes and watches, as it was one of the several major sources for this week's video, a number of the Hicks babies have found their families through trial and tribulation. Stephen Dilbeck, the oldest known Hicks baby, finally found the resting place of his birth mother, Beulah, and met his half-sister. He has found his home and knows a love he has longed for all his life. While he would have loved to have met her, he knows she didn't just discard him like his adopted family. 
family did. His mother was, in fact, told by Dr. Hicks that he was stillborn and died in delivery. In fact, not just him, but his twin brother as well. He hates Dr. Hicks and his actions, believing that he had no right to separate a child from a mother in that way. He may harbor resent, but he knows that his fight for now is over. He's home and he's truly happy for the first time in his life. He can finally rest. Diane Warner found not just one, but two half-brothers from different sides of the family. Now, while her father refuses to believe that she is his, she holds no resentment against him. She truly believes that he had no knowledge of her birth and is just happy to have found her family. On her mother's side, she was instantly welcomed into the fold. She is proud to have finally found where she comes from, and while she will always love her adopted parents, she finally knows her family. Cindy has reunited for the second time with her birth mother, and the two have decided to give it another go. She wants to know that she has done everything in her power to put aside the obvious past and work towards a better future together with someone that she loves and wants to be loved by. As of the airing of the TLC series, she's kept in touch with her mother and plans on spending far more time with her as these remaining years go by. And while she may never know what became of her father, she is content in knowing and growing with her mother. John found out that through his birth mother, he has a half-sister and has gotten the chance to meet her. Now, while his mother has passed away, he is more than happy to finally know what happened. As it turns out, his father was the chief of police of McKaysville himself and came to Dr. Hicks when his affair became a pregnancy. Now, Dr. Hicks assured him that there would be no trouble and sent him on his way, sealing the fate of young John before he had even had the chance to meet him. This explains quite thoroughly how Hicks could have gotten away with this and probably how his practice grew to such lengths without any interference whatsoever. People would keep quiet because they had to keep quiet. Melinda Stapleton, similarly, though not finding any living relatives, found out that her father was the mayor himself. She has always known that she was from a prominent family, but not so prominent as to be the leader of this entire blackened town. Her father, as well as John's, were directly culpable in the illegal trade of 200 and counting infants, even their own, and were more than happy to do so if it meant keeping heat off of their backs. She is furious that her life was taken from her by a father who never wanted her and a doctor who was just horrible enough to do it. Jane, though not finding her own answers as of yet, continues to search and help other Hicks babies along the way. This has become her life, and she wouldn't have it any other way. Hicks's adopted granddaughter, Sally Cobb Sampirek, the daughter of Tommy Hicks, has even befriended Jane and the others, and wants to help them with the search in any way that she is able. Together, these two hope to leave the world with no stone unturned and no corner unchecked in the search for the truth behind the continued atrocities of one Dr. Thomas J. Hicks. Thank you very much for watching this week's video. I know I say this each and every week, but it continues to be true each time. This was by far the most complex and detailed story that I have had to piece together possibly ever. We're currently on page 13 and close yet again to rivaling the sheer magnitude of my senior project paper of 15 plus pages. So I'll end it here. If you enjoyed this strange, tragic, and yet hopeful story, leave a like comment, subscribe, share, and of course turn on notifications. Doing those things, well, there's literally nothing else that would help this channel grow than that. If you'd like to support me outside of that, head on over to my Patreon, where you can support me for as little as $1 per month. And if you'd like to pick yourself up a very finely made t-shirt or sticker, head on over to cnp-productions.com store and pick it up today. The shirts come in sizes from extra small to 2XL, in black, navy, gray, and red. 
and the stickers come in three, four, and five and a half inch sizes. There are new designs released each week, and the designs are often released three to four days in advance of the video, so make sure to check back regularly. Next week, I'm going to do what no film franchise has done successfully in the history of ever. I am going to make a prequel to one of my favorite stories I've told, and it may be just as crazy, if not more so, than the original. It's gonna be me, George, and Peter, I'm telling you. Alright, I'll see you all then. Same bat time, same bat channel. <laughs>